Välkomna till Se Människans scenen och Svenska kyrkans monter. Triumf heter den bok som vi nu ska få lyssna till ett samtal om. Johannesburg 1994. Förändringens vindar blåser i Sydafrika. Det är Marlene van Dijkerk som samtalar här med Ulf Sjögren, stiftsprost i Göteborgs stift. Samtalet förs på engelska. Och om det är så att ni får funderingar och tankar under samtalet så kan ni efteråt gå över till Sensus Monter och vara med på ett samtal där. Nu säger jag, please. Marlene van Nykerk, most welcome to the stage hosted by Church of Sweden, Se Människan, Etche Homo. Thank you very much. Yeah. Honored to be here. Thank you. For, for many of the readers out here that have followed your, your work, I think you're most... You're mostly well known for your, your novel Agat or Hachat in, in, in Afrikaans. Yeah. Uh, we are not going to dwell on, on that today. Uh, rather, uh, the book Triumph is supposed to be here, but we have to imagine that it's here. Yeah. And um, this is just translated into Swedish. Previously, we had to read the, the English uh, translation, but now it's in Swedish. And your novel, Triumph, is a contemporary with historical changes in, in <coughs> South Africa, really. Um, take us back to that time. Uh, the time of the novel, when you wrote it. Uh, the time around the first free elections in South Africa in 1994. Uh, what were the moods like? Now, of course, <coughs> excuse me. It was a mood of uh, great expectations. Mm. And um, everybody was um, anticipating uh, and actually pre-tasting a, a relief, mm. finally to be rid of the scourge mm. of apartheid and mm. all that was associated with mm. it. Mm. Censorship, mm. Um, discrimination, mm. um, for, for the majority, of course, hoped for a better life. Mm and hoped for a different kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. So all of those hopes and anticipations were in the air and people were excited. Mm -hmm. People were hopeful. Okay. But there was also, of course, a segment in society that felt dubious and that felt um, kind of a little bit um, anxious. Mm. We are coming back to that because that mm. is part of the, of, of, of the book as well, what you just described. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, you must remember, um, I mean, people grew up under a certain form of, of sort of ideological orientation. Mm. And, and suddenly all of that was going to change around. So that made people feel anxious. They didn't know, many people didn't know what to expect. Exactly. Um, was it a coincidence or was it deliberate that you wrote this novel during this time of transition? <coughs> or, or well, well, it was a coincidence um, that had to do with uh, the first little house that I was able to buy. Okay. I just started out as a junior, junior lecturer at Wits okay. University, and a relative di had died and left a few thousand that I could put down as a deposit, so I ventured into buying a little house, and the, the only thing I could afford was in Triomphe, and I did it sort of with trepidation because I, of course, knew about Sapphire Town and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and then we landed across neighbors that, um, uh, how shall I say, tickled my uh, curiosity. Yeah. Uh, and I started spying on them yeah. through a hole in the garden hedge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were pretty rough. Yeah. And, um, of course, um, you know, those were also days in which uh, political parties came by and there was a lot of political activity mm -hmm. and so on. So one had a sense that uh, one was living in a novel mm -hmm. somehow. That's incredible. Yeah, but, of course, then you use that yeah. as materials to yeah. pattern a story on. How should we describe this novel? I mean, it's... Um it's a satirical and it's a <coughs> tragic comedy <coughs> at the same time and um, describing all visible cracks that could happen in any family. Um, Look, it's, I think uh, it has to do with um, entertaining yourself as a writer. 
<laughs> so if I'm not shocked or if I don't cry or if I don't laugh, I know that the reader is not engaged. Because oh, I have to read back what I've written yeah. the next morning. Oh, yeah. And if it doesn't stand up and I get mm. either one of those reactions, mm. I have to throw it away mm. because I have to believe it. Uh, I have to be entertained. Otherwise, if I'm not... You see, this is the strange madness of writers. They have to split themselves into mm. the writer and the reader. Yeah, yeah. And if they can't entertain themselves, mm. it's just a bore to be a writer, mm. and it's extremely dull. Mm. Most people who believe in their opinions and only write down their opinions, <laughs> <coughs> one can sense how bored they are, yeah, because yeah, they okay. know what they want to say. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what I want to say. Uh, this is not a bored novel, I can assure <laughs> the readers. It explores inequalities in, in, in the society of race, gender and class. And it's about this Bernardus family, Mel, Pop, Lambert and Treppi. Uh, the Bernardus family. Who are they and where did you find them? The, well, of course not their, their real names, but no. they, li they lived they across lived. the street. Mm. So, um, of course, then I started reading mm. about um, a Triumph, how Sophia Town was raised to the ground. I read about Huddleston's activism in yeah. Sophia Town. And so forth. Um, there was a famous tree that stood in Sophia Town, for instance, which was in the street where we lived. Famous old oak tree mm. that had seen much different scenes mm. uh, from from the scenes we saw in mm. Triumph, because Triumph was then relegated to a municipal workers, uh, white ones could live mm. there then. Mm. But this tree still stood there. O obviously, as I experienced, Fine. the tree is a very, uh, a very huge, big, shady witness to uh, to the life in the fire town. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure lots of people always sat uh, under it or yeah. stood under yeah. it. So I often visit, visited the tree. Yeah. Uh, so they, it, it was a place was vibrant with historical details yeah. that I then read about and so, so Triumph on. was a Triumph was, was actually uh, uh, built on the on the on the rubble on the rubble on the ruins and of, the rubble of was the rubble was this mm. deep yeah so when you planted mm. your uh, mm. your mm. garden it came up spade mm. by spade came up mm. all kinds of little bits and mm. pieces mm. it was quite disconcerting uh, and and the the blacks were removed and in came uh, a new community that and was waiting for a better housing. Yes. And it was a sort of an Afrikaans-speaking poor white South Africans. Yes, not all of them no. equally no. poor, but no. uh, there were some, yeah, people who were no. poor. Who I, can't I think that is a paradox for, for, for us in Sweden. We, we, we are not that familiar, familiar with that, that part of the story. For us, the struggle of against apartheid has sort of been a, a white and black struggle. Yeah. And, and we never really focused on, on the people in between, so to say. Yes, look, I mean, of course, everything is racially determined in South Africa, yeah. and it still is. A lot still is, but um, after the uh, the Boer War uh, that ended in 1904, mm. um, there was a period of poverty of the Afrikaner community, mm. and then the depression of 1913 mm. sort of exacerbated mm. that, mm. and you had a, a huge population of impoverished people who then. Got, became urbanized and mm. came to live in the cities mm. and had to scrape a living mm. doing the most menial mm. things. Mm. Um, one sort of section of those people became involved in the union movement. Mm. So they were the closed uh, worker unions and they uh, were guided by uh, very friendly, activist, progressive Jewish Marxists. Mm. Mm, yeah. So there's a history about that. Mm. But then there were others who then uh, had to make use of the helping hand of the Afrikaner elite who yeah. thought they must gather up yeah. the poor unto their bosom yeah. in order to constitute uh, what we call a, a f culture folk, yeah. a cultural, a cultural nation. nation yeah. So uh, in the course of that, of course, a whole lot of pretenses yeah. Yeah. like the art song yeah. got uh, sort of imprinted on the Afrikaner side. And that was the strategy of the national yeah. government yeah. after Yeah, and a lot, a lot of it uh, was just pretentious nonsense yeah. and yeah. skin deep and yeah. yeah, not grown from 
a long tradition but mm. imposed. Because your novel reveals um, also how apartheid failed even those uh, it was ideologically designed to, to, to benefit, like the poor Afrikaner family, like Bernardes. Yes, because some of those mm. people fell through the slits yeah. in the floor and yeah. didn't get the, the ga into the gathering yeah. up of mm. the poor. Yeah. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit more of that? Because I think it's, a, it's, a, it's not very well known in Sweden that, mm. well, um, that it was a failure also for them that was it was supposed to lift up. Yes, yes. Well, today still one finds in South Africa that probably the descendants of the, the poor section mm. of the white Afrikaners, mm. Mm. That they now live in caravan camps in, in Danville, in mm. Pretoria, and, and a growing number mm. Mm. because there's more pressure on the section of the workforce that they mm. are engaged mm. in. Mm. So there's a lot of, um, of suffering there, yeah. but I don't think, yeah, it's not of the same quality. Yeah as uh, suffering in the people who have been traditionally mm. disadvantaged. Mm, mm. Um, if you look at uh, photographs by David Goldblatt in his book, mm. Some Afrikaners, mm. you will find a record of those people mm. and you will see a certain forms of degeneration, mm. social degeneration, mm. familial mm. degeneration. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, the Bernardes family are, are quite a, an unsympathetic bunch of people. They are racist, they are incestuous, um, well, they are quite crazy. And at the same, same time, you're describing their, their human sides. Was it important for you to, to also... <coughs> yes, but what I want to the do... The two sides uh, of the coin, so Yes, well, I want to unsettle the reader, that's the main mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So I have to make the reader uncomfortable and force the reader into a position where they have to... Um, reconcile completely different kind of tensions. Mm. So the reader has to think the following. Oh, I don't associate with these kinds of people, really. I can't identify mm. with them. What mm. a shocking book. And on the other hand, oh, I'm very curious what they're going to do about the, exactly. <laughs> the broken fridge. Yeah. And also, <laughs> oh, this language is shocking, but I want to get more of it because it's kind of, you know, yeah, a yeah. nice irritation. Yeah. So I want to fix up the reader in yeah. a place where the reader doesn't know what to do yeah. and carries on reading out of curiosity uh, uh, against their own inclination. Yeah, so I want to get the reader to sympathize with people that they've never in their yeah, life exactly. associated with. And you, so then it you means I torture the reader. Yeah. Yeah. Now I felt for, after 300 pages, I felt for them. You, you see, you and felt I, for... And I could even put myself in, in a given hist uh, historical position, and it, it, it could have been me. Yes. I mean, we don't know, we, we don't choose where to yes. be born, we don't choose our parents, yes. we, we, very little we choose yes. actually. No, no, poor Mole, her fate mm. really touched me and mm. she made me cry. Yeah. <laughs> Your novel is, of course, strongly imbued with, with white Afrikaners' attitudes in the, in the apartheid area. Have, have you seen any, moving from, from, from the past 30 years ago now into the current situation, have you seen any changes in these attitudes since a more democratic South Africa has emerged? Is South Africa today less occupied with, with race and group, group rights? Uh, and, uh, um, it, it, that, that question is a very difficult one. Yeah. Um, I have plenty of difficult questions. Yes, yeah. you, I know. I've seen them. I've yeah, you've seen them. Um, of course, I think, um, you must talk not about a homogenous group. Yeah. You must uh, think of different groupings yeah. with different interests. Yeah, yeah. I think the progressive side and even sort of the moderate side of Afrikaans community mm. have embraced the new situation mm. and tried to live within mm. it mm. with um, uh, quite a, a huge amount of guilt mm. sometimes yeah, of course, yeah. and a feeling of responsibility mm. and mm. some people are uh, st uh, stretching themselves to help mm. and so on that's one section mm. there's another section who says we told you so mm. okay um, and they are people who said this is never going to work, but they said it for the wrong reasons. Okay. Then there's a left progressive side who I think out of naivety and a lack of historical insight as to the fate of the rest of post-colonial Africa, mm. hoped for a miracle mm. 
mm. based on a South African kind of exceptionalism. Mm. Mm. And they are extremely disillusioned. Mm. And um, they basically all do yoga now. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> South Africa has one of the most progressive constitution there is to be found. Yes. That is, that is absolutely correct. Yes. Right. And, and then I was thinking about, let's say, feminism, in generally speaking, in, in South Africa. Feminism. Yes. And, and the struggle for equal rights, gay rights, yes. and non-discrimination. Yes, yes. Is that movement uh, today perceived as more integrated, in an in integrated struggle? Is it more colorblind these days or, or is it still tied to race and, and, and a degree of privilege? I think there's a growing feminist movement in yeah. South Africa across the races. Mm. I, I, uh, I say race yeah. always yeah. was... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I understand. Uh, but there's a growing sort of um, solidity in the movement mm. Mm. Uh, because um, there's a lot of gender-based violence in South Africa. Mm. It has to do with poverty, with social mm. disintegration, and so forth and so forth. But there's a growing and very vocal group mm. trying to, to do something mm. about it. Mm. But you must understand that I think the constitution of South Africa is very much ahead of some of the kind of uh, norms and values of traditional people. And I'm now talking about everybody. Mm. You still get Afrikaner patriarchs who think the woman mm. must know mm. her place. Yeah. I won't say anything about the others that I don't know so much about. Mm. But you can read sociological works mm. about it. So um, when, for instance, there's a problem in Ghana for the government prosecuting uh, gay people or wherever, you will find um, our Minister of um, Foreign Affairs mm. saying, asked for a kind of reaction to that would say we, we, we don't involve ourselves in the policies of other countries in Africa, which I think, based on the constitution, is not the strongest kind of response that you no, can give. No, no, right. Yes. Yeah. So what I'm saying, and there are people even in progressive circles that say that the, the constitution looks as though it could have been written in Sweden. Mm -hmm. but. The articulation with the situation on the ground mm. is not entirely a fit. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, yeah it's yeah. a difficult mm. situation. When it comes to, to the, the upbringing uh, uh, generation, the South Africa's young lions, um, uh, are there good reasons for hope uh, with regard to their aspirations? The young lions. Yeah. So you have to be more explicit. No, I mean the young people. The young people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think there's a, there's a generation yeah. of um, urban cosmo yeah. cosmopolitan yeah. people. Because I think that hope is important. Who, yes, of course hope is important. Because there are so lots of mi miseries and, yes, 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 and yes. pessimism. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of reasons for the pessimism, but I do think there's a more informed, mm. better educated, young, mm. urban generation mm. Mm. who, if they get the, the opportunity and the chances, mm. would, would be fantastic as mm. a new generation mm. of leaders, maybe. Mm. Mm. Um, but I, um, I'm not an expert on the social formation mm. of that group exactly. Mm. Mm. I notice certain expressions in film and mm. in music and so on that makes me think, okay, right, you know, go mm. for it yeah. now. Yeah. Now is your time. Mm. Um, but I think because of historical reasons, there is in South Africa a general lack of political maturity all over. People don't understand you've got a, demo a democratic surrounding now. Mm. And actually, you can change mm. your world and you can get a government that you want. Mm. Just make it. Make it, you're right. Mm? Yeah. So um, they, th that uh, realization still has to ripen mm. a little bit. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're all waiting for yeah. it to yeah. happen. Yeah. 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 And it's paramount that, that the young generation feels hope. Yes. Otherwise, there is no future. About hope, of course. Um, Ho hope is not optimism. Hope is something different. Uh, right, right. Hope without optimism is the title of Terry yeah. Eagleton's new book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That? And Emily Dickinson's beautiful poem, Hope yeah. is that feathered thing yeah. that never asks a thing of me. Yeah. Yes. That's wonderful. Marlene Fanica, time is flying uh, when you have a nice 
conversation like Thank this. Thank you, yes, for your And, and let me just question. wrap it up uh, by, uh, as a sign of gratitude to, to send you away uh, in at least three of the official South African languages. Thank you very much, Marlene. Bair danki, my fro. Siya bulela kakul. Hambagash. Thank you very Thank much. You much. That's Thank wonderful. You much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.